Hello and welcome. Anyone who's been to Merchant City Yoga on a Sunday knows how much I love catching up with everyone over a cup of my freshly brewed spiced chai. These Sunday chai sessions really bring everyone together. A true celebration of friendship, community and connection. I want to try and capture some of that magic and share it with you at home. So I've invited some familiar faces from our MCY family to chat with me over a cuppa. I'm affectionately calling them the chai sessions. Pop the kettle on, get yourself comfy and come and join us. Hi Nadia, thank you so much for joining me on my chai session today. I don't know about you but I have my cuppa at hand and ready to go. Just before we get... I've already had mine um, so I'm I'm already ready to go. You're prepared. Um, But just before we get started with our chat, just for anyone who doesn't know you, um, Nadia is an author, a yoga teacher, also a former news journalist as well, which I think um, helps Nadia bring something different to to this conversation as well. In terms of author, she's actually written a book called Yoga Manifesto. And that's how this conversation and Nadia visiting us at Merchant City Yoga in May has all come about. And and that's part of what I want to chat a little bit about today. And um, I don't have my copy of the book with me, Nadia, just now because I've lent it out. I've only got I've only got my Kindle copy, which isn't quite as um, striking (laughs) as, as as your well, covers. I've got it here for people to if they if they want to see it. So there we go. Yeah, recognise the cover. And I noticed um, that your paperback is coming out in a beautiful luminous yellow colour. Um, is it next next month? It's it's coming it's out time. in June, so it'll be coming out just after um, I come to visit um, Merchant City Yoga. But I'm I should hopefully be able to bring some copies if um if I've got my hands on some brilliant and I'll bring some along um but yeah I'm really pleased with the cup with the color I wanted the paperback to be a different color and also to be quite um you know I wanted it to be have be as sort of attention grabbing as as this one so um because just in case I don't write another book again I hope I do but, <laughs> but just in case you know I wanted them to be quite sort of um stand out yeah yeah and and very noticeable and I mean, one of the things that struck me right away is uh, our coming to yoga story is very, very similar um, because it was my mum that took me to my first yoga class as well, kind of under duress uh, back in the late 90s when, like you say, yoga wasn't really that cool. No. Um, at all. And I just wonder how many of us that are out there, if it wasn't for our mums, basically staging some kind of intervention for a variety of different reasons, um, we wouldn't be yoga teachers in, in, in the position that we're in just now. Yeah, um, why, just out of interest, why did you not want to go? I, I apologise to my mum later. Um, I thought it was for old ladies. Mm. And the style of class that my mum was doing I mean the irony the huge irony of it is mum was probably not much older than I am now at the time but I felt it was like an old lady yoga class it was a one a beautifully gentle half class um and one of those really deceptive classes that feels like you're not doing very much at all Mm, mm. but actually you are because one of the the questions that I was going to ask you was having been taken by your mum to yoga class, what do you think it was that kept you going back? What kept drawing you back? Yeah, that's a really interesting conversation because I didn't have, um, you know, without giving it too much, uh, giving too much away in the book, I, after that first class she took me to, I didn't, um, I did keep going back, but then I had periods of my life later in life where I had, challenges with yoga and it wasn't working anymore in my head in my mind and I was pulled away from it and I you know so it's been kind of an in and out relationship I mean more in but there's been difficulties but yeah I think what got me going back initially was um and I think it's the same reason actually that got me coming back many years later when I was in despair for various different reasons again I write about these in the book at moments of hardship 
I came back be- probably because of that first seed that was planted, um, which was I was really I don't know about you, but I I didn't think it was for old I hadn't didn't think it was necessary for older women, older ladies, but I and I didn't actually know what it was. I, I knew that my mum had been kind of I was vaguely aware of what she'd been up to. But I was mainly really obsessed with myself and unhappy and miserable at the time as a teenager and not really interested in anything. So I wasn't really interested in what she was doing. Um, And she insisted that on that occasion that that we went and I didn't really want to go. And then I suppose it was just really impossible to really argue any further. She took me along. And same, it was... um, you know, it was a, it was quite a gentle mixed bag group of people, men and women, mm-hmm. uh, tracky bottoms kind of thing. I felt really yeah. awkward and I really wasn't comfortable in the beginning. And it was probably about an hour. I don't remember, but I think it was probably about an hour. Um, and something shifted for me in that first class. And <clears throat> I've tried my best to explain, describe it in the book. Um, and it took a while, you know, I went from being awkward and self-conscious and everybody's looking at me to something happened, um, a cosmic shift happened. And then when I was lying down, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> when I was lying down at the end, um, again, uh, you know, I don't want to give too much away, but but I do try to describe what happened. And I think what got me coming going back was that feeling, whatever it was, that feeling of all the kind of knots and the tanglements of, in my head. <clears throat> um, there was a, obviously it's not a permanent shift, is it? It doesn't stay forever, but it, which no. is why we need to keep doing the practice. But sorry, this is a really long, long-winded answer. But I think for me, I didn't really quite know what I was getting into, but I thought something was really interesting here because just for a small, short reprieve, I sometimes think, you know, if we didn't have a mind, would we have a, as many problems as we do because I had so many problems at that time in my I thought I saw in those problems and I still now when I face issues and the anxieties I sometimes think gosh you know it's because it's my mind is so complex we have we have we, we've got such complex brains that we get caught up in knots but then if we unravel the knots and we just come back to find where we are and I don't think I knew that that was what was going on there but I think that's what was going on there I was just like all caught up and then I realized, oh, there, there I am. There I am. You know, I'm here and this is it. And um, then you go up, back out into the world. And um, I wanted to come back and find that feeling again, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, because certainly for me, I wouldn't have been able to put my finger on why I kept going back. I just knew there was there was just something kept on. And even now, like, you know, with the, the benefit of hindsight and kind of more study and I'm going to say intellectual knowledge and a little bit more experience can look back and say maybe it was this or with that it was that but actually I don't know and even even these days I'm not 100% sure if I can put my finger on exactly what brings me back to my practice every time because the other thing I really want or one of the many other things I really appreciated in your book as well was you know you you talk about how yoga has definitely helped you through some tough times but you also see that sometimes it didn't. Yeah. Sometimes it didn't work. And I I really appreciated that because that's certainly been my experience of it. And, and I've had a few fallings out with my yoga practice myself and tried to give it up when I thought it wasn't working how I thought it should. And, and also I think it 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 kind of speaks against a little bit the the more common narrative now around yoga as a panacea for everything mm, and all ills yeah 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 um and so I really appreciated that well I appreciate can I just just to, sorry to interrupt but just to say that I appreciate you saying that because not many people have um I have loads of really brilliant interesting conversations with people and um they have lots of different issues with um, the state of modern yoga and the modern world and all of that. Um, but um, yeah, not many people, but, but then often people are coming newly to the practice and they're often in that kind of new phase, um, which I think is the wonderful phase, really, that first bit. But um, yeah, not many people tell me about they haven't been with it long enough necessarily to have had falling out, falling outs with, or they've had more commitment than I perhaps did. Or maybe, you know, life got so bad for me that I just unfortunately and I'm quite stubborn as well so I think you know I'm still quite stubborn but I was 
you know, then, and it can be a real strength, actually. It can really be really quite good for persistence and for perseverance for me. But then at, at times, you know, if I really didn't want to practice, then I wasn't going to do it because I didn't believe in it anymore. And I was let down by yoga or whatever story I was telling myself, <clears throat> or I was, a, <clears throat> you know, I was a bad person and the issue was with me. <clears throat> and um, yeah, so I just thought it was yoga's fault and didn't want to acknowledge that um, it was a deeper thing than that, you know, that, that we're dealing with me. It's the practice is not the problem. It's my approach. It's me. Yeah, and, and sometimes the practice isn't the answer. Yeah, I think so. You know, necessarily. Um, and for me as well, it, it kind of throws up a, a question that I ask quite a lot. And, and it concerns me a little bit in that if yoga can be anything, if it can be anything to anybody, what is it? Like, what, what actually is it then? And I, and I wondered if you would speak a little bit to well, what yoga is to you or yeah, on the understanding a... that it, it, cha it changes all the time it's like trying to, yeah. to stand on quicksand you know it's, it's going to change all the time and if I asked you that question in a half hour's time you'd probably give me a different slightly different answer it is but... it, 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 that's such a massive question but you know actually it's quite simple for me now because um, I write about this in the book as well um, and I was quite mm, I was quite sort of what's the word apprehensive about maybe divulging all of this but I did um because I wasn't sure how like long time are people who've been practicing way longer people I respect actually some of whom have been to Merchant City Yoga uh, teachers who have been more dedicated perhaps than I have been throughout their lives I was concerned about mentioning this but what I talk about in the book is that because I've tried I mean yoga's been the constant in my life and it still is present but also I've kind of sought answers and hope and looked for a um inspiration in other places as well and I've sort of ended up with an amalgam of things that really help me and support me and sustain me and one of them is like is zen um buddhism and but but they all beautifully complement each other and zen really inspires me um and I suppose through that amalgam of practices that I have and so it's kind of what yoga means and it's also what zen and what how I'm trying to live my life now means is what it's all boiled down to somebody asked me this the other day actually and again sorry I do give slightly long-winded answers because I just you know everything is so nuanced and I think for me it's you know just that having been what I've been been through what I've been through and what I see other people go through I just feel like gosh life is hard and in a world with yeah. inevitable suffering and I don't this is not a downer but I just think in a world of like yeah inevitable suffering how can I find peace and then what can I do for peaceful, for cultivating, you know, peace within communities that I move in? And I don't mean to sound, for that to sound really lofty. It really is what it's boiled down to for me. And I just, and I mean moments of peace. I don't mean world global peace. Obviously that would be wonderful, but I'm thinking about what can I do? I'm, a, I'm really big in, big into, um, you know, I think with yoga, there's a lot of talk about what yoga is and all of that. And I sometimes just get like, I don't know I don't again mean to sound glib but I'm just really big into like a little less conversation and more action um you know to use one of my favorite Elvis songs um, <laughs> to, to use that as inspiration it's, it's like you know there's a lot of there's a lot of talk about yoga and I actually love talking about it so I say that as someone who loves talking about it and geeking out about it and what does it mean and you know I, that, that's a joy and also it's um I think without action um the yoga doesn't really it's not working you know we need to be thinking about um being engaged with the world as much as we um discuss practice yeah you know could probably argue that yoga is action can't we if we were going down that geeking out um kind of way that's one of the other things i really appreciated about the book um, so for me personally not really big on the the fluff and the frill that sometimes surrounds yoga and and as a person just really quite pragmatic and practical so I like I really like things I things that are really practical appeal to me and that's what I really liked about the book because while it absolutely talked about some of the the kind of the loftier ideals contained within the philosophy underpinning the yoga practice 
it actually came down to you started chatting about what we as individuals could do as well and and mm. I thought that was really really empowering because sometimes we can get a bit stuck and a bit frozen and well those things are so big and cultural societal whatever else it is like what what really can can we as individuals do and and I thought that came through really powerfully and oh, it, it felt felt to me like it was a call a call to action so you're talking about you know and um, we have to engage in the world it, your book felt to me like a real call to action actually yeah I think it's interesting because a few people have sort of said to me um quite a few people have said that to me and said that they felt empowered to um, yoga teachers and students actually as well um and I've been, I've been quite surprised by the number of yoga teachers who said they felt empowered to kind of do things or raise questions and conversations with people they work with which is which is really cool because I'm not big on telling people what to do and I've um sometimes I've had people not so much recently but I've had people sometimes sort of um contact me and you know ask me for answers and I I'm happy to be contacted and I love having chats with people, but I, I really don't want to tell you what to do. I'm happy to work it out with you. Um, and that's what I've tried to do in the book, because in the book, um, there's there's lots of yoga books that are brilliant. And, you know, obviously I've read read lots of them and on trainings and things like that. And we need those books and people should keep writing the books that explain um, the philosophy and stuff to us. And I think like you, I'm quite pragmatic. And also I think this is probably a failing of mine, but also a why I've written, how I, you know, what brought me to write this book the way I have, which is that I really need to see tangible examples in my life. So for mm -hmm. me, um, sitting around, and again, I'm not being disparaging because I like sitting around and talking about yoga, but like sitting and thinking about what ahimsa means in abstract is one idea but then thinking about it in terms of what it means in my life or non-greed or you know any of the other sort of um the yamas and the niyamas um I needed to think and I often reverse them so rather than thinking about him stars is like the one people most like talking about and it's very very important and I think a lot of people talk about not being violent whereas I'm interested in flipping it round this is how I made sense of it and this is what I wrote about in the book and this is again where I thought about engaging it you know like thinking about it in terms of engaged within life is well I could think about not being violent and you know all the basics like you know thinking about what I eat and thinking about how I treat my body treat other people the words I speak etc very simple or I could think about all of that stuff in terms of what am I doing to promote peace in the world you know um, and then I think it gets a little bit more interesting because especially with yoga teachers, yoga businesses and things like that, you know, bring, going back to the fluffy thing you were talking about, it's if you start thinking, you know, when when is, you know, because there's violence, but then there's also subtle things that we're doing that aren't great for the for the bigger cause, you know, and then we might look at the way that we're, we're selling the practice or, you know, whatever it is, you know, I don't run a business, but like um and and you know is that sort of you know are we what are the pillars that are holding up the business or the things that we're doing um yeah so yeah so I did I kind of wanted to give ideas and inspire I suppose without sounding making myself sound too big but also you know as because I was rattling around in my life quite unhappy before this book um came about and how it came about was because I felt like I was laughing and getting angry at things that nobody else seemed to be. And I was kind of like looking at things and feeling really bemused. And I'd sometimes like pipe up and raise it and get quite batted away. So I left it and I kept it all to myself. I spoke to a few friends about it who were outside this whole world that I was in. And um, so it's really heartening now that when people read the book, like you and like other people like me, it's, it's really nice because gosh, I was really lonely with these thoughts and yeah, it's just it's just really nice way to kind of I've met so many, you know, other people. And I think I tried to write a book that was hopeful. And I think the book is kind of coming to life now through conversations I'm having with people. And I think it's I suppose it's it's really showing me that wow, you know, I you know, I was right to feel, feel hopeful because there is hope. Ah, uh, and also right to kind of be thinking what you were thinking, because sometimes like I have felt that is it just me that thinks this is a bit off or and and it's certainly been my experience that there's 
when people talk about the business of yoga, sometimes that's not considered as part of your yoga practice. Like I'm really, yeah, I'm not perfect by any stretch at all. Um, but I've always really strongly believed that the way I run my business is as much part of my yoga practice as, you know, the shenanigans I get up to on my yoga mat and, and how can I bring some of some of those teachings to some of the decisions that I make and, and how I operate and how I interact with the world. And and it and it kind of left me a little bit bemused that other yoga businesses didn't do that. So you kind of shone a spotlight on that a little bit and, and maybe put some language to it and um it's because I'm yeah. grappling with all this myself. You know, it's not I haven't come here as an expert. I'm grappling with all this myself. Like I I've I've done some terrible things in my life. Some of them I've written about in the book. And it's you know, and I've been unkind and I've lied and I've yeah, I haven't always treated I mean, I'm not trying to paint myself. I haven't been a, an evil bad person all my life you know for, for, but I'm just saying I've done lots of things that have hurt people and I've hurt myself and I think that this is all me grappling with how can I look at myself the thing I didn't really want to mm. do a long time ago how can I think um about what I can do and so and and how can I use the practice because that's what I wasn't doing for a long time I would go and go to practice in the Shala or wherever I was going I would do my self-practice and then I would go out into the world and back into this disastrous life I was living and then I would go back to practice and integration and um, and joining it together is kind of where I'm at now and I'm not again like you definitely not getting it right all the time but also no. you know what I'm not even trying to get it right all the time anymore because I think it doesn't I mean I'm not trying to pop out but I'm just I'm not even trying to get it right all the time <clears throat> I'm just doing my best and I get overwhelmed like anybody with life and so I try mm. to just for me what really helps actually and I don't I sometimes forget to even do this but I do what I come back to most is what's right in front of me what can I have what do I have control over right now what's in front of me what can I do because otherwise it's really easy to get despairing about um, just before we came on to have a chat, actually, I was just thinking about um, why I came to this book, because people often sometimes ask me you know, where it came from. Um, and there's lots of different reasons. And, and we can talk about that maybe when I visit. But Absolutely. I was thinking about I actually thought I was going mad. And then through writing this book, I realized that actually and I've met other people who think they're going mad for various different reasons, not just to do with yoga. And I actually I've realized and, you know, Again, I mean, maybe I'm simplifying too much, but I realise that actually I'm not going mad. Um, it's the world that's gone mad. Um, and when I meet people like you and I meet other people who've read the book and stuff, you know, it's really heartening for me because I realise that I'm not the only one. And I thought I was the only one and I thought I was going crazy because I thought nobody yeah. else agrees with me. Nobody else sees the things I'm seeing. Nobody else is bothered. Nobody else is angry um, because we're not allowed to be angry, obviously, in this fluffy yoga world. Um, which I think is completely nonsense because it's a human experience. And I think actually, I think part of the reason why I got so entrenched in my problems for so many years was because I was probably repressing anger and hurting myself. And actually, if I'd found a way to express the anger, because I do express anger in the book as well, but I've tried to do it in a non-shouty way. I've tried to tell it strongly and firmly and I, with conviction and but in a way that hopefully is helpful because I think anger can be helpful it's telling us something absolutely like I can't I can't actually remember who it is just now but um I've read or heard somebody speak recently that um talks about anger as being really helpful as an agent for change and that's what it, yeah. it's t it's telling you that something needs it's there for a reason it's telling you that something needs to change if you can take the time and kind of unpick it a little bit to see what it is that it's that it's trying to tell you rather than just reacting um right away definitely um and, and but I also think not burying it and not hiding it and not thinking you're not allowed because we can transform these feelings I mean yeah. there's, that's I've, I've come across that idea before and I really believe that to be true and it's certainly true for this book because I was really angry at the beginning and I didn't want to write an angry book so what do we do with that we have to kind of find our way and uh, Tony Morrison um 
the writer Tony Morrison once said, I remember reading this um, when I was writing, actually, because I was get, I got stuck at various points, obviously, when I was writing this book. I mean, I've never written a book before and writing is hard when you're trying to sell a story, even if you have been a journalist. It's not news journalism. It's a book. So it was hard. But she said once she said so many great things, actually, that really inspire me with writing. Um, and she said once, um, if you're getting stuck, you know, and, you, and, and everything's just too much, she said, write from what makes you angry and I think it's a really good way of getting things out and I think that's what helped me when I was writing and I think it can really help in life you know what is it that's making you so angry what is it that's disturbing you really get to the root of it but it can be the pain as well but these are not things we want to look at and that's why you know practice can be challenging and difficult it's not about I mean the thing is it is about the postures for me as well like people often say it's not about the postures and it really isn't it's true and if the postures didn't exist, I don't think I would have come to practice. Do you know what I mean? It's like my mum took me and it was the postures that helped me access everything else eventually. But it's also, yeah. I still need, I'm somebody who gets quite wound up very frequently and gets quite tangled up quite think, frequently because I'm quite a thinky, thinky person. I do it without think realising, you know, I'm <clears throat> just very of my head type of person and I get really wound up and tangled up and um, I like the postures. I like how they make me feel. I like not being able to do them and moving towards doing them. I, and actually, I get frustrated less these days when I, because there's certain things, you know, certain postures that, you know, I mean, in Ashtanga, for example, like, you know, I still can't get my elbows on the floor in Kapitasana. And it's because the right side of my body is really tight. I don't know why. Maybe trauma, maybe some emotional pain. I mean, you know, like I didn't used to think, I used to think it was my body that was wrong. And actually now I think it's any number of reasons. I still can't get my elbows on the floor. I mean, it doesn't matter anymore. I wish I wish I could actually, I do wish I could, but also- Of course. It doesn't, um, It if, if anything, I've become more patient. I, I notice that actually it changes and some days I'm tighter and some days I'm a bit further. And yeah. some people have bodies. I've got friends who've got bodies that just keep opening slowly. Oh my God. But mine goes in and out. It's like an elastic band. And um, that's just the way it is now. <laughs> you know, I'm fine yeah, with I just, Yeah, those people, Nadia, I just try and delight for them. <laughs> it's like, yeah. if you could make that capitasana look a little bit more difficult, I would really appreciate that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, one of the things I really appreciate about you and I'm excited about when you come and visit is that you are very very open to being questioned which I just love again I get a little bit nervous and I always say to people if you find somebody who or a yoga teacher who thinks they have all the answers and tells you how it is run away very fast because none of us do and I wondered like now that you've started so the book came out last year and you started touring around a little bit and, and having these conversations with people. Um, what's the most surprising question someone has asked you about the book? Oh, wow. That's or about a, your experience that you're writing about? That's a really interesting question. I'll have to think about that because... Oh, somebody actually asked me, this is a really simple, like a little light one, but somebody asked me um, recently in Cheltenham, why I put triangle pose on the front, um, which was did surprise me. Good, it was a good, good question. question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so that that was that. And um, I suppose my, I mean, yeah, it wasn't. I mean, I don't know if you're looking for a profound kind of question. I, I don't know if Just there's any. either or. Either or. I mean, the reason with this, I mean, this is an illustration of me. Um, it's interesting because um, my answer to her was, I wanted something, I wanted, I mean, I didn't design the cover, you know, designs were presented to me and then I chose this one. Um, and um, the reason I wanted triangle pose is because I like triangles anyway. And triangles, I've got a sort of affinity with this posture because I did it in my first ever class. And I do mention that in the story. Um, yeah. I don't think it's an easy posture. Um, I think it's often looked at as a beginner's posture. I don't think it's an easy one, but she found the designer found this picture of me on, on my old, on my website. It's not there anymore. And, um, had done this illustration and I saw it and I thought, my gosh, that's the picture of me. Cause she'd, what I really liked was the two little strands of hair that were <laughs> coming out of my messy bun. Um, but I really wanted to, I wanted um, a picture on the front that had, um, both feet on the floor. 
and it was firm and it was solid and it was grounded and it was um you know not pinching my arsena or handstand or something like that because as, as wonderful as those poses are to practice that's kind of going against the whole story that I'm trying to sell here so um so that's where that front cover came from but yeah I was quite surprised by that question actually because nobody's ever really mentioned the cover to me they say the color's nice but I don't think I think most people don't know that it's an illustration of me and you wouldn't necessarily know because mm. it's like it looks like anybody but um we and also the way it was initially designed was with the palm um like well actually it was a fist which I loved but I didn't want it it reminded me of Black Lives Matter too much and I didn't want to be appropriate yeah. that symbol so I changed it yeah. to a palm and then they did the five fingers and I said oh well I don't practice it that way I practice it like that um uh-huh. in Ashtanga I was taught that the energy goes in all in the same you know not like that so so they changed that as well um and I wanted it to go through the O and um so yeah I mean I think that's kind of that that was a surprising question I mean I think in terms of other questions people have often asked me if it was hard to write about my personal story um and yeah I I, I mean I, I would say I, I'd say that I I um actually found that easier to write about I think my mum found it hard to read but I think that was quite compared to some of I found the guru's chapter really hard to write I was surprised by that um and um yeah but does that answer the question I don't know no it doesn't I think that's a really nice place to yeah to wrap up our chat today because um whoever's got more questions need to come and see you when you come and visit so Nadia, thank you so, so much for taking the time out of your day to chat to you. And I'm very much looking forward to hosting you in person. I'm really time. looking forward to it. And it was lovely to chat. Thank you, Judy. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you enjoyed our chat. If you've got any questions, you can email me or find us on social media. I'll see you here next time.